let me read this to you. This is an exhortation. No, it is a prophecy. It didn't come from here. I believe this prophecy was sent to us. I know it was sent to us out of the prophecies that come to the uh, prayer center in Tulsa, but it bears witness. It's nonetheless the truth, and I'm sure it'll bear witness with your spirit. <sighs> I'm exhorting you. Uh, I told you up front this is an exhortation concerning your giving and to those that will be also part of this through the website. And every week you have an opportunity. Um, if you want to give, you can go on our website and give through PayPal, or you can just send it. Um, there's an address on our website of how to send it. But let me read this to you. I'm reminded before I read this that um, oftentimes I'll hear Homer say, come with us on this journey, especially when he's teaching on, on Sunday nights. He'll, he'll often admonish, it, admonish the young adults or whoever's seated there in a loving way. Come with us. Come on. We, we want to entice you. We want to do whatever we can to say this journey is worth it and we'd love for you to go with us we'd love for you to go with us so this kind of reminds me of this um, also I'm reminded before I ever read this is that Jesus said uh, where your treasure is there your heart will be also um, those are one of those inter interchangeable kind of uh, it would make sense either way he said where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You could say this, where your heart is at, that's where your money will be at. You could say it that way too. In other words, if, if you're invested in something, if you really love something, you'll, you'll give towards it. That's just a plain truth, okay? If you believe in something, you'll, you'll give in. This prophecy says, do not lose your birthright. I saw people standing by the side of, of the river as the army of God crossed the river and went to battle. The people standing by the river were intending to be a part of the army, but they had stopped to wait and see what happened. As they waited, the army went further, farther, and farther into the battle until those on the shore could barely see them. Eventually, the army advanced so far that those on the shore could not catch up. The army is on the move, and right now it is not too late to be a part of this army. That's why I was like, yes, that's a good song. Praise God. I didn't ask for it. That was, there's an army rising up. This army is on the move, and right now it's not too late to be a part of this army, as it is our inheritance, our birthright. For those who wait too long, the battle will eventually be too far away for them to join. They will mourn then because they were meant to be a part of this army, but they didn't stay close enough to Jesus to be used in the battle. The Father's intention for their lives will not be completed, fu completely fulfilled. As they hear the voice of victory and deliverance in the distance, they will mourn knowing that it was God's plan for them to be a part of this war. They were trained and prepared for this time, but they grew weary or distracted. So when the war horn was blown signaling battle they failed to respond instead of stepping into their place in the army they waited and watched as the army gradually moved away from them during the time that rome governed there was a long-standing tradition that involved the rubicon river if any army crossed this river without laying down their weapons it was considered a declaration of war and rome would attack the end time army of god is marching to the Rubicon, and God doesn't want any of us to be left behind. It is not too late, but the army is moving, is on the move. It is very important that we be so close to him that we can hear and obey his voice quickly. The Holy Spirit will not overwhelm us with his instructions. He will not overwhelm our will with so much of the glory of God that our choices are not free. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And his voice is telling us he has come to set the captive free. He is telling us repeatedly to listen to his voice. In Hebrews 3.15, the Amplified says, Then while it is still today, if you will hear his voice, and when you hear it, 
Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the desert when the people provoked and irritated and embittered God against them. Do not think you will use a map to catch up to this army if you have lost sight of them. We are not to follow a map. We are to follow Jesus. We are to respond to every word he, has, he speaks to us. A person can give directions to a location by looking at a map, even if she, he or she has never been there or even know the map maker. The history of the world is littered with failed revivals that tried to use a map instead of the active indwelling presence of Jesus. It is not too late, but do not wait. The Lord tenderly loves us, and he wants to complete our birthright, our blueprint, his intention for our life. He longs for us to succeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Appreciate you staying with me during that reading and concentrating. Hallelujah. We are his army. And I appreciate your consideration, those of you here and there, of all the good things, because we have a worthwhile course to follow, an assignment to fulfill. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We ask you now to speak to our hearts here and worldwide. We thank you, Lord, for all of everything that we need for this live streaming to come in. We are asking you, Lord, to bless, keep, to give, we pray, according to your riches and glory, meeting every need according to your word, as you so promised, and we agree with that word. To them and to us here, we thank you, we praise you, and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Let's all stand together. Hallelujah. I want to say that uh, what I mentioned Wednesday night that we would have up on the website, and when I say we, it's never me, it's someone else, praise God for, for people that helped me, and that being my wife in this, there is two PDFs that go along with last Sunday's message, and that is healing the sick and the breath of God. And those, those two PDFs, those are short teachings that the Lord gave us, and man, I just feel like they're very, very special. And uh, if you want to go on our website, you can, you know, you just open it up and read it, or you can print it out and you can put it someplace where it's part of your daily reading for a while until you feel like you, you get it in your spirit. But I think that's really good. One is healing the sick, and the other is the breath of God. Two papers that you, I think, really need to add to your repertoire of, of things to read. So praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What else? Uh, let me encourage you, stay current. Stay as current as you possibly can. If you're not in here with us, boy, we are making it extremely easy for you to stay current. We're putting, we're about to go live streaming. Uh, boy, if you just, if, if you were at home for whatever reason, um, it, it sure wouldn't be because you stubbed your big toe. <laughs> You'd be here. Hallelujah. But I'm, I'm saying for whatever reason, it, you know, really, you, you could watch us on the website there's there's youtube every service is up within sometimes that same day um and uh if you can't watch us you can listen to us um you know walking or riding down the road because it's all in mp3s and so it's just it's just really making it easy for people and we 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 want you to stay current stay current um Case in point, uh, Rene is, is going from his LPN to his RN, and he's having to take courses that, you know, involve his Wednesday nights. So he came to me a couple weeks ago or so and said, Pastor, you know, I'm not going to be able to be here for, you know, the next couple of three months. I can't remember now how, many, how long, but he's, you know, he's, he's going to be away, but he knows to stay current. You know, there, there's that availability. Stay current. If you're, if you're, if that, and I understand sometimes those kinds of things come up. And so there will be a series of services for a little while that you won't be able. But listen, I advertise that not because I'm on a egotistical trip. Folks, I, myself, I, I give all the glory to God. I have never heard um, what I'm hearing from the Lord in these days. And I give all the glory to you, Father, all the glory. But I'm telling you, it's a component of what we've been doing, all of us collectively, for years. We've been graduating to this point, and this doesn't come on you sovereignly. 
It comes through fasting and prayer and meditation of the word. And if you don't have a foundation, you can't build walls. So you can't just come. God couldn't just sovereignly come and start talking to me all about all these kinds of things. Now, if I hadn't had the foundation up to this point, well, you have you followed me on this foundation and you've had other great instructor instructors. And and Homer is a, a wonderful teacher of the word that's in here. And there's others of you that can repeat this message and and stand and 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 and, and teach a good uh, message that is the same doctrine that we're teaching here and we appreciate that kind of duplication that is among you men and women praise God thank you so much um, so stay current stay active um, Sunday night we and I, Marty maybe you can help me with this I think we've got tonight and maybe next week is the I don't know if you can remember but it's the one where we're going to take communion because we've been following Gary Carpenter's teachings on on communion we've got how, how many more we've got four more okay four more so at some point in the very near future we're going to take communion in here on a Sunday night and uh, you can if you can't get here there's a lot of people that uh, <laughs> thank God for everybody that comes from out of town to the Family Prayer Center <laughs> hallelujah <laughs> <laughs> I heard somebody say that's a whole church. I didn't say that. <laughs> but thank God for, uh, you know, thank God for everybody that comes from out of town. And thank God one day we're going to have a lot of people from Immokalee here, too. <laughs> that's going to be really cool. <laughs> um, but uh, so I understand, you know, if it's a ways on Sunday night, we give you that, obviously, that room. And so, but you can go on and listen to those. And uh, you don't have to listen to, you know, through here, you go on Gary's and, and there's a whole, I think Marsha's been doing that. She's been listening to all those. She may have got them all done. So, uh, but we're going to take communion. Hallelujah. Glory. That's pretty much it. Oh, by the way, there's a solar eclipse tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, I don't think he's coming back tomorrow, but if he does, I'll see you there. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I think it's uh, our highlight is like 257 or 253 is it starts about one something and it ends about four something. Don't look at it. OK, I mean, don't look at it with the naked eye. They say don't even look at it with sunglasses. There are special glasses. I think you can get two dollar glasses at Walmart or whatever. They have those e e eclipse glasses. And uh, and then, they, you know, it's really neat. They'll tell you on uh, they'll tell you on the on the. Uh, you can Google and you can make these little glasses that, that are really kind of neat too. But um, when it fully eclipses, we don't have the full eclipse. You'd have to go to South Carolina to get the full eclipse. Uh, we get about 82%, I think, is what I read. But still, it's going to be kind of neat at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So, and you could, for two minutes, look at it. They say you can look right at it at the full eclipse, but we're not going to get a full eclipse. So still, don't look at it, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Woo! You know what? Tomorrow, no, you won't because you're healed, brother. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's a good one, Homer. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> I'd love for him to call me at, at 335 tomorrow and say, Oh, my eyes are hurting because I looked right at it. <laughs> yes, sir. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Man, we get good reports all the time. I was getting one this morning. Ralph, stand up real quick. Tell us, you just went to the doctor. Well, come up over here. I got to do this, yes, because we're worldwide now. Hallelujah. Tell us what kind of doctor's report you got a couple days ago or whenever it was. Well, I've uh, been going mainly because of uh, been battling in uh, sugar diabetes. And uh, this has been since the end of February. And my starting point was 622. If you think you can live at that, you know God. But uh, I went Thursday, and he told me, no more pricking your finger. He said, we don't need to check blood sugar no more. He says, your A1C is below average. So he said, we don't have to worry about that no more. And uh, he said, we'll just check you every three months. And he said, just go on with your life like you never had to worry about it. Hallelujah. And uh, I didn't share this with you, but... Uh, there was only one person I did share it with. 
but uh, I feel in my heart I need to. Yes. Uh, he took me off to medication, and I don't have to be Mary Poppins no more. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So I can walk in the sun. That's fantastic. That's an inside joke if you were here Wednesday night. Hallelujah. That's great. Hallelujah. So Ralph has been, because I know he lives next door, he's been claiming the promises. He lets me know he's been claiming the promises. He's also been doing the other part. The, the main thing is to claim the promises and stand in the Word of God. That is the foundation. All right? And then he's doing, been doing the applicable things for his body. I mean, for months and months, maybe going on a year, he's been walking like four miles a day, just getting his body. Your body will heal itself a lot. It'll do a lot. Hallelujah. Amen. So, glory be to God. I'm just saying this. You, you can't... Um, okay, Jesus... Because I may fall in this category. <laughs> you can't claim the promises. They will work. But you've got to do what James says. You've got to have a corresponding works without, you know, faith without works is dead. You, you can't get up at 12 o'clock and go in there and have a big bowl of cereal every night. Okay, we'll do it every night. <laughs> and then get up the next day and claim that you're not going to have all kinds of physical problems. Okay? Now, you can cheat sometimes. I'm saying that because I do. Okay? <laughs> and a little bit of anything won't hurt you. Okay? I'm just saying corresponding physical actions work. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. I'm hearing some laughing on the front row, so I don't know what that's about. That's from my family, so I will hear that later. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. Are we ready for more? Are you thirsty for more? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so we are into kings and priests, and this is lesson eight, and it is kings, kings sitting in his throne. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's just pray for just a moment. Let me just worship the Lord. Father, we just praise you. We give you all the praise and glory. We love you, Daddy. Father, we love all of these. We are just so thankful for all these men and women and elders, men and women, and those that are becoming elders our young men, young women that are becoming elders in this house and those that are out there listening and watching who wherever they're at, they're an elder in the spirit and they are becoming leaders and generals that will follow the Lord in the days ahead and lead others. And Father, we thank you for it. Blessings, blessings now in Jesus' name. We thank you for it, Father. Amen. Hallelujah. So, the like I said, today's title is kings sitting in his throne. And as I say that sitting in his throne, that may sound like a misnomer. In other words, a, a wrong way to say that, to entitle that, but it's not. You'll find as we turn to uh, Revelation chapter 3, please. This will take us back to some memory of former days when we taught last year the book of Revelation. Um, what was the name of the title there? Uh, yeah. Warnings from the book of Revelation. Yes, hallelujah. So we're going to look beginning, uh, and this is still on our series of Kings and Priests. And this is, is helping us and helping you to understand who you are and what you have become in Christ Jesus. Now, let's begin at look at, at in chapter 3, looking at verse 14. This is uh, to the church of Laodicea. And I don't know if you remember very much about Laodicea in that particular teaching, but some of it may come back to memory as we read. 
14 says, verse 14, And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation, the creation of God. Well, let me just stop right there. I can't get much further because the teacher in me has got to just pick on this verse for just a moment. This is, of course, Jesus. I, I hope your Bible uh, displays this in red because these are the words of Jesus that gives you some kind of understanding that Jesus is the one speaking this to John. And he is speaking this, and he said, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness. To start with, Jesus was the faithful and true witness. What was he witnessing? He was witnessing to us of who God is. He was witnessing to us of how and who your father is and how he wants to deal with mankind in love and in also your authority as born-again believers over sickness, disease, and every abnormality that could possibly come at you. And Jesus showed that, exemplified that, through his human existence. Through his human existence, he witnessed to, God, to us who God is and what he, how he wants to deal with us and how he wants to work with us and the dominion that he wants to give us as sons and daughters in this life, okay? The beginning of creation. He's the beginning of creation. That doesn't mean he was the first one that was created that goes along with the Colossian scripture that all things were created. For, John says all things were created for him, by him. Uh, Colossians says all things for him. He was the one by which all creation, the substance, really, the carpet that we're standing on or the chairs that you're sitting in, on this morning, every component of the camera, all of the electronics, Everything that is in existence today came out of Christ, the one that we call Christ, the one that we call Jesus. He's the beginning of all things. Now, having said that, verse 14, Jesus said this, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, if we went back to that old teaching or that teaching that we did last year, I think it was last year, time goes by so fast, that every one of the seven churches of the book of Revelation exemplifies the entire church on planet Earth. Current. This is not just, it was not, and we just proved that. I mean, we just took service after service to prove that the words that Jesus was speaking was not just the existence of the Asia Minor churches. In fact, if it does only include that, you can skip the book of Revelation. And we know that you can throw no book out, okay? But those churches don't even exist anymore, okay? The, all these churches that we're reading about here, they, they're, it would be in, if, if it only applied to them, you don't have to read this. Because they don't even exist anymore. These, are, these typify or symbolize the church at large today on planet earth. And one of those churches is the church of Laodicean. God looks and sees a group of believers that call themselves Christians. And many of them are blood washed. Have had a true born again experience with Christ. And God, if you were able to... Talk to him or talk to Christ, the one that spoke. He would say, that's the church that I was speaking about who would be in existence in 2017 or just prior to my coming. And he says this, what we just read, because you're lukewarm, neither hot or nor, neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because, I, because thou sayest. And he said this, this was the heart. This was what the church was saying, whether they were saying with their words or the action of their heart, they were saying this, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing 
and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. Is that a statement or what? Now listen. I'm not, I don't have a chip on my shoulder. I know in my heart that just because we're somewhat a, a small group and we believe in and, you know, it, it, we believe in what the things that we're asking for, okay? Um, if it was just a lot of stuff that we present to you, if it was just already in, in there, I wouldn't even say anything to you. I just... It would just do it, okay? So that tells you at this point in time, all of our needs are met, but at the same time, we are believing. We're believing. And we're at a point where we're, there's, we're, we're not a huge group. So I'm saying that in preface to kind of put in maybe a justification for what I'm about to say. There's no chip on my shoulder against large communities of churches, like a big church. I think it's wonderful. If they've got them in there and they've got them saved and blood washed and prosperity. I like, I don't know about you, but I like prosperity. I like things clean and pretty. And I, I like things shiny. And I, I, I don't like poverty. My spirit doesn't like poverty. When I see poverty, I don't condemn the person in the poverty. It's just yuck. That's not what heaven's going to be like. So if a church has a nice vestibule or they have a nice church, that's cool. That's wonderful. And I see, and you, you don't get them, but I get a certain magazines and I get them online and I get them through the mail. And I'm telling you, some of the, there's, some, there's some churches built across America you would not believe. And I'm not condemning them. I'm just saying, man, when you walk in there, um, it's incredible. I mean, they have, oh, it, it looks like a mall, some of them. They've got a coffee shop over here. Um, they've got all kinds of stuff. And then, like, for the kids, Miss Gay, it's just incredible. I'm telling you, their, their kids, their kids' um, building, you know, just for their, their small ones, would make, I mean, would make maybe five, ten times this whole church. And I, they have super slides in, inside there. You know, they have all the playground inside there, you know, for the kids and stuff. I mean, and the, 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 the money that it has to, 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 to pay for that is millions and millions and millions of dollars. I was recently at a place where somebody told me, and I was at a huge place, and, they, and they, the grounds was so incredible, just incredible. And the place that I went into was incredible. And the person told me, this one person, not, not a pastor, but another person told me, and they weren't bragging, they were just saying, they said, all this is paid for. All this is paid for. And, there's, and not only is all of it paid for, there's money that we got from something else that's set back for uh, whatever else that we need. And I'm thinking, glory to God. <laughs> Ooh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. So there's much of the church... In America, especially, that so qualifies for the Laodicean church that they equivocate that because they have money, money equals blessed. Blessed means must have been given by God. So God must be rubber stamping or validating the doctrine. Okay. You got, you, you've got the whole grounds paid for, camera equipment, everything. You guys are on worldwide TV. There's 5,000 people here. All the stupid stuff you're saying. <laughs> I'm validating it. I'm validating it. Because <laughs> you're blessed. Obviously, I mean, right? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so... Here God looks from heaven and says, you know what? You think you're rich. You are poor. You're blind. You can't see the scriptures. You can't see truth. Now, I'm not mad at big churches. I mean, we may be, be a big church one day. Amen. Amen. But just because he, he's saying, like, if you think that riches equivocate to righteousness, it's sad. And he said, and he said, you're naked. <laughs> Adorned, we're so beautiful, you know. You remember that old 
uh, fairy tale, what, which, which one was it? it? The king that had the designers come in and they said, design something for me that is beyond any apparel that has ever been designed. And uh, one guy, they had all these designers come in and one guy said, here is an invisible, an invisible robe. Put it on and wear it. Well, he was naked. <laughs> and he got on his horse and he was parading down through the streets. <laughs> and, and everybody in the kingdom said, you know, all the, everybody was, knew that this was a king and he was supposed to be wearing an invisible robe that everybody was supposed to, to see if you could, you know, really see, you know, really see. And it was like, everybody was going, oh, it's gorgeous, it's gorgeous, it's gorgeous. And all of a sudden, he came by this little girl standing there, and she goes, oh, my God, he's naked. <laughs> well, the church, much of the church is just naked. It has no covering. It has lost its spiritual covering because it has forfeited it through the unsoundness of the Laos, Laodicean lukewarm doctrines that have been taught and preached. We can go home now. <laughs> Hallelujah. In fact, I had this message, and I realized this morning real early, there's no way to teach it. <laughs> there's no way to teach all this today. We'll, we'll, you know, that's why we just go to where, wherever we can, and, 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 and hallelujah, and give plenty of room for Miss Gay's meeting next door afterwards. Hallelujah. Uh, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, and he's not talking about physical gold here, tried in fire. Now he's talking about our character, tried with the fire of God's word, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. How many of you just say, Lord God, I want that eye salve all the time. Listen, amen. Daddy, if daddy rebukes you, it's for your good. Hallelujah. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Hallelujah. Now, he said as many as he loves, he chastens. Now, this is acceptable. He's, he doesn't put cancer on you. He doesn't put disease on you. He doesn't, he doesn't cause you to go to a, into a car wreck or take away your finances. But he will come to you and chasten you in your spirit by the word of God. And that is that conviction that says, I, I, gotta, I know that's not right. I know i got to change in that area. So that we cry out and say, Lord, please, don't ever stop. Because he says if we are his children, he'll do that. Hallelujah. I want that kind of pain. I ask for that kind of pain. And I hear all the amen saying, yes, amen. Behold, look what he says. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, understand this. This is not in the context of trying to get somebody born again. We're talking to the Laodicean born again, quote, born again church, okay? This has been a, a favorite scripture for people to use when they're getting somebody, hopefully a candidate, born again. It has nothing to do except in fruit. God does come to people. The Holy Spirit will come. But the root of this is certainly not, he wasn't talking to sinners. He was talking to the church. He was saying, church, I stand at the door and knock at your heart. You've become lukewarm. You've become indifferent. Please, let's have this once love affair that we, or let's have this love affair that we once had. Let's come back into fellowship. You come back to me. Come back into fellowship. So, last two verses in this, 21 and 22 says this, to him that overcometh, and this is the crux of today's, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Now, watch what he says there. He says, to him that overcometh. How many of you know that we are expected to overcome? Hallelujah. It's not a slam dunk, okay? The spirit that we've been given, which is the born-again nature, that is a slam dunk. 
But whether or not you will exercise your authority from cradle to grave is up to you. Or from whatever point that you started on this. In other words, if you so decide to choose to go back, he can't stop you. And he won't stop you because he loves you enough never to take away your free will. So that's very important here. He says to him that overcome, we have to keep a posture, a position in our hearts that we are going to continue to overcome and win. Win. Win against sin. Um, win against sickness, disease, depression, anxieties, fears, jealousies, debates, all those. Winning is something that you do and overcoming is something that you do every day. Hallelujah. It's every day. Now, you progress, and your high-level marks are not, uh, you progress as far as where you're at, but you never, you, you never look at it like, I've, al I've already arrived. You understand that? I mean, at this point, most of you in here are not fighting uh, uh, fornication or adultery. You're, you're, you're fighting maybe another level of your love walk. That's, at least you should be, okay? You, you shouldn't be fighting the strong temptation to steal. You should be fighting a level of, Lord, how uh, compassionate. Uh, when I hear the sound of, let's get the sick healed, and is that really my heart? Or has the, my heart been drawn away into the earth? Uh, as far as do I love the things of this earth more than the things of God. So praise God. So we're always overcoming. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. So we exhorted those scriptures. We are invited to share. Now watch this. We are invited to share in his throne as he has sharing, is sharing in his father's throne. Is that right? What does it say here? He says, I, I, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. In other words, he was the perfect example. Thank God he was. And am set down with my father in his throne. Isn't that amazing? So now Jesus is inviting us to sit with him in his throne, as he also was invited by his father to sit with him in his throne. Thrones, let's just talk about that for just a moment because this is significant and this is very important that you catch this part. Thrones, there's an oftentimes misconception when we say or picture in our mind's eye what we're talking about, thrones. The place, thrones, the place of authority is usually seen as a physical seated throne. It is far more than that. It's an eternal spiritual place of authority. In other words, I don't know how you picture a throne, but thrones are usually, in my mind's eye, um, a large seat. Uh, I picture, I, I do believe, uh, you know, I believe that it does spell out in the book of Revelation and other scripture, that, that when you get to heaven, you will see an image of one that we call the Father, and he will be sitting on a throne. Um, there will be another human being slash human being God or God human being that will be in a very vivid image, the one that we call the Lamb, the Christ, Jesus, and he will be there. There is no, uh, although he is God, there is no uh, mention of a throne seated by the, for the Holy Spirit. We just know that he's omnipresent, he's everywhere, and uh, I certainly believe that he could appear it, because if the other two have that attribute, he could appear. But there's no mention in the word of God that there's a throne there for him. OK, but we are going to see those. But what I'm saying all that to say this thrones are far more than just a physical place for someone to sit and to rule. It is symbolic, as you would probably well know, I hope, of a spiritual authority that has been given to us a spiritual a great spiritual authority that has been given to us and Jesus says this this is what is amazing he says uh, um, that you would sit with me in my throne as he is also 
sitting with his father in his throne. Here we see God. Now, this is, this is amazing. I want, to, I want you to think about this. And I'm not just trying to be sci-fi here. I'm really trying to get you to understand authority. Here we see God flatten his throne. Okay? Usually, in, a, in the dimension, I don't know what dimension you go into this, fourth dimension, fifth dimension. Usually when we think of God, I'm going to turn my back on you for just a minute. If we're looking up and we're thinking about God sitting on a throne or on judgment day or we appear before his judgment throne, we think of us in a vertical position where we're standing and looking up to his high rise position of a throne where he's seated. And that's not a bad, it's not wrong that's applicable to think that way it's proper and jesus seated there with him uh that doesn't mean that jesus doesn't get up around his throne and walk around but he is he is spiritually seated there and he physically will be seated there at times but here it's not when he says i want you to come and sit with me in my throne he's not saying i'm going to scoot over a little bit and squeeze you in here because the Father scooted over in his throne and squeezed me into his seated position. What he's saying is, is that this vertical place has now, in this instance, has been flattened out. And everything has come on a plane. Do you see that? Because now that place of authority is not just a seated position. It is that something that is, it is something, a unified place of authority that kings as we are, as kings and priests, come and we sit in that room with him. Hallelujah. At this, he doesn't say, come and sit on my throne. He comes, says, come with me and sit in me on the throne. And that's a far greater pronouncement of authority because we're not just with him, we're in him. Hallelujah. That's a place of authority. And God just does this. He takes vertical and flattens it down to a horizontal fl a plane that we're able to sit there in that room with him and rule as kings and priests here on this planet. Hallelujah. That's good. That'll get her done. Praise God. Kings sit on thrones, but in this scripture it is said we are to sit with him in his throne, not on his throne. Jesus' wording here is very powerful. Sitting in... His throne is more powerful for the purpose of meaning than sitting on his throne. And a scripture that would also be a part of that is in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I usually, when I talk about, use that scripture, I oftentimes will misquote it. I'll say that I'm seated together <clears throat> with Christ Jesus. It doesn't say that. That's not what it says. It says in Christ Jesus. That's stronger than with Christ Jesus. Because in him, I'm inside of him. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Now, obviously, if I'm in him, I'm with him. Okay. So you got it. Praise the Lord. Amen. In essence, Jesus was commanding us to overcome as he overcame. Do you see that? Do you, do you see that? I hope you do. When he says this, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and have sat down with my father. You know what? He's encouraging us, and I believe it's far more encouragement. It's, a, it's like a command saying, look, I won, you win. I'm seated here in my father, with my father, because I overcame. Now I'm telling you, you overcome. I'm commanding you, overcome, win, sit down with me. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Jesus overcame. Now, listen, this is very important. Jesus overcame in his entire human existence on this earth. From the cradle to the ascension, he never suffered failure. Isn't that a good witness? That's a good witness. John said he is the faithful witness. I think that's a wonderful witness. He never suffered failure as the result of sickness. He never was, he never was kept from an appointment 
due to being too sick to get there. He never apologized to God for not being able to do what he had asked him because his body would not allow him the freedom due to the infirmity that held him back. Do you understand? Okay. Jesus never suffered the failure of sin. He never chose to give in to a temptation because he offered an excuse of not being strong enough to stand against the temptation. And I know as I read this, you're thinking, yes, that's Jesus, and that's my Lord. But he has flattened this plane. He has come in this. Now, there's another place in... Um, in Revelation, it's later, it says, I see, he's, John saw a group sitting on thrones coming with him. But in this, in, 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 in Revelation 3, he flattens this plane and he says, we're basically all the same. Father, Jesus, and all these kings and priests, we're all, we all have, we've come here because we're overcomers. God Almighty, that's good stuff. <sighs> He never suffered the failure of sin. He never chose to give in to temptation because he offered the excuse of not being strong enough to stand against the temptation. Jesus had a full understanding that the life that was in his human spirit came from his Father in heaven. John 1, 4 says this, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, John 5, this is actually Jesus speaking here in 26. He says, for as the Father has life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. How many of you would know and agree that Jesus knew that he had life in him that was different than all the life that was on the planet? Different than the death, I should say. There was no spiritual life. But men just living and breathing was not life. Jesus knew he had life in him. He knew that the life was more than sufficient to withstand any temptation that sin or sickness could bring against him. Now, we're going to read a little bit uh, from Luke's gospel, but let me say this before. The temptation that Jesus faced in the wilderness, the temptations, there was three of obviously. The temptations that Jesus faced in the wilderness was on three levels and covered every dimension of man, spirit, soul, and body. So let's turn, I said Luke, because Luke records it too, but let's turn to Matthew chapter 4. I want you to see it in your Bible. Actually, I'll say this. If you hear me talk about the first, second, and third temptation and the chronological order where the last being the greatest temptation, um, we really find that chronological order out of Matthew. If you put Matthew 4 and Luke 4 together, you'll find that Luke, by the Holy Spirit, really didn't find it. It just wasn't his assignment to bring forth a chronology of how that temptation plays. So you'll see in Luke's gospel that two and three are reversed. Those two last two temptations are reversed. But in Matthew's, Luke does not use the word then. But Matthew uses the word then, which gives a connectiveness to knowing that in each one of those temptations, he says then, then. And so you understand that this was actual the chronology of how things took place or went down in the wilderness. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said unto him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. This is that shield of faith, Wednesday night group, 
that we've been talking about. The shield of faith. It is written. It is written. It is written. Verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of this world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give to thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. The last of these temptations that Jesus suffered in the wilderness corresponds. Now, I'm gonna, I'll read this twice so you can really get a hold of this. The last, what was the last one? The last one we, did, we just read was uh, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain. And we don't have time to teach on this, but that was supernatural mountain. There's no place on the planet where you can see all the kingdoms of the world. Okay, so he did a panoramic spiritual presentation, slideshow, however you want to say it, for Jesus, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and said unto him, All this, the glory of them, all these things will I give thee if thou shalt fall down and worship me. Well, somebody said, well, he was a liar. Yes, he's a liar. Excuse me. He, he's a liar, but, but he does have certain powers. And if you don't think that he's not the one that makes the pop stars and the rock stars that and the gangbangers rich, you're 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 you've lost it. <laughs> okay, he can make them rich. They sell their souls to him, and as a result of it, he will make them rich. And he and and the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. Okay, now Jesus could have, because he was man, basically sold out and did exactly what, if it gets too much, Marty, just wave at me, and, and, and he could have done exactly what Adam did and sold out, but he didn't. But what was available to him was for sure an exchange of all the glory of the earth. And everything that went along with it. Okay, so you got that part. The devil um, leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered. To the last of these temptations, and this is what I said, please listen. The last of these temptations that Jesus suffered in the wilderness corresponds with Mark chapter 4's last on the list and highest form of destruction against the word. And that's the examples that Jesus gave. In other words, the last temptation that Jesus faced in the wilderness would be equal to the corresponding teaching that Jesus did in Mark chapter 4 when he said this, and the cares of this world, this is the last of all the things that can actually destroy the word of God in a believer's life. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. Okay? Satan hit him with the last or the, the worst at the end to see what he could do. When Satan offered Jesus the kingdoms of this world, he was essentially offering him the lust of other things. This temptation included every sensual lust that a human being could ever face. This temptation would have represented the spiritual part of man because Satan's desire desired worship as the trade-off for his ability to give Jesus these things. Our spirits are who we are in God, and our worship is the hallmark of our relationship and fellowship with the Father. Now, the other temptations. The other temptations covered both body and soul. The temptation of turning the stones into bread would have represented man's attempt to provide for himself physically and financially. The temptation to jump from the pinnacle of the temple would have covered every emotional temptation that a human being in this life could ever face. Nothing was excluded. The temptation was more than just to prove God's ability to rescue 
It actually was a temptation to commit suicide. There is nothing excluded in these temptations in regards to mankind, yet Jesus suffered no loss in any of them he overcame. Hallelujah. Praise God. He's a faithful witness. We look at these temptations that Jesus faced for us as the epitome of temptations. This is true, but we have to understand that Jesus lived victorious for 30 years prior to this event. It would be impossible to think that Satan left him alone during this time, yet Jesus never suffered loss or failure. Hallelujah. Simple put, how many of you know that just because he faced these temptations in the wilderness doesn't mean from the time that he was from cradle to 30 years old that he never faced temptations. He faced plenty of them. He faced them maybe on an everyday basis. We just got the highlight of the, the most spearheaded spiritual part of it in Matthew 4 and in Luke, in, in Luke 4. Isaiah 53, 5 says this. Oh, or let me read this first. Isaiah 53, 5 shows us that Jesus became our substitution. Everybody say this. Jesus is, Jesus is. my substitution. Maybe I should have said it this way to start with. Jesus was, Jesus was. my substitution. My substitution. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 53, 5 says, and this, this bears it out. This is our scripture to know that he was our substitution. But he, you don't have to turn there, but he, you could, you could underscore this if you were there. It's all these, these ways to say it. But he was wounded for our transgression. In other words, he took it. But he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him or he. That's substitution. That all is substitution. And with his stripes, we collectively are healed. Hallelujah. He became the substitution. Jesus became our substitution. And this part you really need to get. He became our substitution in the wilderness against all temptation. It should be understood, though, this is very important, it should be understood in regards to his substitution for us that he was not taking away the opportunity of temptation, but rather revealing to us the power that it could ever hold over us. Do you understand that? In other words, his substitution doesn't take away the fact testings, Temptations, the word temptation is not just tempted to sin. The word temptation there is also a Greek word that means test as in trials, tribulations. Do you not agree that all those things were a trial of his faith? Mark chapter 4, to take the word from him. Satan showing him, I'm telling you, the man, and I'm calling him the man, I respect him as my Lord. The lamb standing there in that place, I don't know how long, but that panoramic view. And don't you think that he wasn't putting images of women in front of him and riches in front of him and power in front of him? And not only was he seeing the image, but just like when your, mind, when your eyes see something, if you allow it, then it will go to an emotion and you begin to feel the emotion. And I'm sure that when Jesus was standing there and he's watching this, that not only is he seeing all this stuff, and he's seeing stuff that, I mean, stuff, stuff, that all that emotion is being pressed against his soul and against his spirit to say, my God. To, I mean, he, 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 we say, my God, but he, he would, that feeling of like, oh, what would it be like? If I just gave in, would there be any way back? If I, maybe I just could just give in just for a little while because this looks good. But he stood there and he suffered it and would not allow it to enter into him. That's a faithful witness. Hallelujah. Some will say, but he said in his prayer 
In Matthew 6, 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. His prayer in Matthew 6, 13 is not an escape from the opportunity. Listen, if the only place I know that you escape from the opportunity of temptation is to die. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the guy came to pa Pastor Hagen, Brother Hagen, one time and said, pray for me. He said, what do you want me to pray for? He goes, I pray for me that I won't go through any more tests and temptations and trials. He goes, you want me to pray for you that you will die? Because <laughs> on this planet, you ain't, that, that ain't happening. Okay. So Jesus was not, that prayer was not, don't misinterpret when we say substitution. He's not substituting as to take all that away so that it'll never come at you. It means that you'll never enter into it, that you'll never become a part of it. Hallelujah. And lead us not into, Paul said, this is what Paul said. He, he just exemplified these words of Jesus about not leading us into. It's not leading us into means this, like I just said, not that there won't be an opportunity, but that you won't give in to the opportunity, that you won't allow whatever the, whatever the temptation is. It, it, it's, it may not be a moral temptation. It may be a temptation to fear. It may be a temptation to a lot of different things. But he's our faithful witness. And he has said, I overcame, so I'm commanding you, all of us, overcome. In becoming man's substitution against temptation, Jesus was the prototype for every born of God human spirit that would ever come in the future. Romans 8, 9 says this, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And I said last week, respectfully, a good Baptist will fight you on this, and they'll say the spirit of Christ is the Holy Ghost. And that is not. The spirit of Christ is is that born again nature spirit your personal spirit that has been changed second corinthians 5 17 from death to life a new creature in christ that is that spirit of christ in other words his cry his spirit was it was a duplicating spirit remember we went through that lesson it was not like the first adam but the last adam has a quickening spirit we had a title like that it, he has his spirit. He could, the Holy Ghost could take Jesus' spirit or one exactly like his, so much so that you could say it's the spirit of Christ and duplicate it or replicate it into billions at one time. Whoever would believe on him could have a spirit of Christ just like his spirit. Hallelujah. Simple enough. Jesus essentially, now I love this part. I love this part. Because what he did in the wilderness, even though he was tempted prior, those were the epitome of all of temptations that any human being could ever face. Jesus essentially road tested the born again spirit. I like that. Just think about that just for a minute. He road tested. Road tested. Because he didn't, he didn't beat the devil out there in his deity. He beat the devil out there in his humanity. In the same way that you and I get to beat the devil. Jesus essentially road tested the born again spirit for us and proved, hallelujah, that it could withstand any kind of test or temptation that could ever be levied against it. Hallelujah. Come on, kings and priests. We, the born again believer, that's all of us, all of you. This throne, this throne room is flattened out now. Sometimes we go before him and it's vertical. But right now as kings and priests, it's spread out horizontally. Hallelujah. We, the born-again believers, stand in the standing of his substitution for us. He proved that the born-again nature could withstand anything and not suffer failure. There hath, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able. Why? Why, can't you, why? why is it impossible for you to be tempted above that which you're able? Because the born-again nature spirit that you've received, the Spirit of Christ, has been road-tested, and Jesus has proven that it can withstand any temptation. 
Hallelujah. But will, with the temptation, make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Jesus defeated Satan, not through his deity, as I just said, but through his born of God humanity. He was proving to Satan the lesson that Adam failed to give. Remember that, what we had a few weeks ago? That lesson that, what was the name of it? Kings teaching angels. That was the whole thing from the very beginning. God wanted Adam to step up in the garden and kick Satan out and prove that human beings have more authority than fallen angels. That, that's just it. God, God wanted us because he loves communion. But part of the reason why we're created is to settle an age old, an age old argument that God in a created being, a human being, is more powerful and has more authority than angels that are fallen. We're supposed to be answering that, that argument. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He was proving to Satan the lesson that Adam failed to give, that the life of God and human beings could withstand and take dominion over all the works of Satan, kings, teaching angels, as I said. Whenever a product, now get this part, listen. Whenever a product, because we're still on this road tested, I, I, I just felt this was so good to get this point over to you. Whenever a product is put on the market, it is first tested to prove or to see what levels of conditions that it can endure. Okay? Tires are tested. Okay? Uh, how many miles they can, uh, they, they can be expected from them. Paints, shingles on roofs, all kinds of technologies or technologies or technology are used based upon the specifications, what the specifications say about them. And I, I said this, or the Holy Spirit said this to me, the space shuttle is launched into space based upon the testings of its components. From the engines that empower the orbit of the earth to the protective membrane that must, was, that must withstand thousands of degrees of temperature on the earth's Reentry, everything is tested. Books that are called, and I know this as a contractor because I, I had to work with these in the years gone by, 20-something years ago. Books that are called specifications or specs are developed based on extreme testing. The specifications or specs will tell an engineer what to expect from each and every component. I remember, and I don't have this in my notes, but I'm just thinking out loud, when we would build those big condos, um, the biggest, the hardest part was the foundation. And they would have these, the, these big cranes come in there. And if we were going to build like a 25, because I worked on some 20 and 30 story condos, and we would do the, all the, the structural part of it. And uh, we didn't do the, the pylons, but they would have a company come in there and drive the pylons. And then they would have us, and those pylons would be driven by, by a pile driver. And this crane would work with it. And then we would go in there and pour these big caps on top of it. And those caps sometimes would be, you know, taller than a man. And they'd be like 20 feet wide because you're going to put a 30-story high-rise on there. They would have, when they send out the concrete for those pylons, concrete comes in what different levels of what they call PSI. That's per square inch. And every... Like for house for houses, we would pour like a 2,500 or 3,000 psi. In other words, there's no house that needs to be built any stronger than that. That that. But what it means is, the crushing power you can put at least 3,000 pounds of uh, per square inch on that piece of concrete, and it will not it will not bust apart. So you can that's the specifications on it, and that you can well for a condo it would be much higher than 3,000. It'd be several thousands. PSI, okay? But what they would do is they would pour that, we would pour that, and we would know that that was the PSI that was supposed to go in there, however many thousands of PSI it was, and then there would be a, a, a testing company that would be over to the side, and they would have these cones, and they would, we would have to fill up these cones, and they would put these cones over to the side, and they would have like a 21-day break on them, and they would Sorry, they would put these cones over to the side and they would have them there. So this, this company would take them 
to their laboratory or wherever, or they might come back on the, the job site, I couldn't remember. But they would test these cones, and they would put them under pressure after 21 days or so, so long, or 30 days, or however long it was, and they would pressurize them until they could see if they could get them to break. If they broke, if they broke anything less than, let's say, 5,000 PSI, they would make us, this is how serious it was, they would make you, at the, if, if they would determine whose problem it was, was that did you order the wrong concrete or did the concrete company send you out? Even if you started building on that, you tore down everything, you dug up all the, the, pot, the uh, caps and everything and re-poured those footers at the cost of a million dollars if you had to. Because if the PSI did not, would you guys like for me to use a handheld or is it okay? Keep on? I'm okay? I don't think so. It's just right down here. Okay. Oh, maybe. Yes. Thank you. That helps. It would, <laughs> if it did not spec out, it had to be dug up. Okay. Do you get the picture? Jesus has specced our born again spirit. He's road tested it. He's gone to the max. We say that was our Lord. Uh-uh. Yes, our Lord. But he overcame the same way, or the, I should say it this way, we must overcome the same way he overcame through the power of that new nature. Hallelujah. That's good stuff. So it's in, essentially Jesus wrote the specs on our born again spirit. If you have a, the Spirit of Christ, you know what to expect. The Spirit can withstand without failure or loss any temptation that Satan or this world can throw at it. It has the same spiritual, and I like this part. Now, if, if there's anything that we can catch, and we're getting close here, if there's anything that I almost, I almost did not um, name this because we started off with thrones and so i titled it but i almost wanted to name it this how tough tough is our human spirit our born again human spirit that's amazing how durable it is in other words there's nothing that satan can contrive get together this afternoon with all his devils nothing no temptation for lust of the flesh or depression, or fear, or anxiety, or anything. There's nothing that he can come against you with that can break down your born-again human spirit. And if we we're to live out of that, then the supply of our soul comes from out of that place. Hallelujah. It's been specked out. We're, we are, listen, here's the th thing that you've got to understand, and I uh, hope this is good. You are as tough as Jesus was. In your spirit, you are as tough as and as durable as Jesus Christ was. That's powerful. That'll get her done. Hallelujah. So therefore, it would be a, a, a sin. It would be a lie if if we have the same spiritual toughness that Jesus had through the Spirit of Christ. You are none diminished from everything that He had to resist. And to win without failure. Uh, the, the, a lie of the highest order would be this. I cannot. I can't. I can't, def I can't defeat this. I can't defeat this sin. I can't defeat this sickness. This, this uh, poverty. Okay? Depression. I had somebody call me <clears throat> yesterday. He said, will you call this person... They're having a panic attack right now. Will you call them? I said, well, you know, I really don't like to do that. Because if they're having that and they want me to, then they should call me. I don't like for somebody else to call me and tell me, call them. I, I don't like to do that that way. I mean, if you want something, you call me. Uh, so anyway, I said, oh, I, they, they, were, they were upset. And they said, well, I said, okay, would you, you want me to do it? I, I'll do it for them. For their sake, yes. So I called this person, and they, they were. They were having a panic attack. And uh, I said, uh, I don't know what my words were, but uh, I mean, it was I was compassionate, but I said, okay, we're, I'm going to get rid of this right now. 
basically. I said, I'm just going to, it's just going to go right now. Just, I mean, there's just no, and uh, listen, I know, uh, panic attacks, they, they, they can't, af- they, literally, they can't affect your body. It's not that they're, that's not real. I mean, your heart, palpitation, palpitation palpitations, uh, the sweat, the sweat, everything, that's real. That's real. But it's still coming from a devil. It's an emotional realm devil. That's, and that doesn't mean the person's evil. It just means that Satan has convinced them that he can do this when he can't. And I said, you know, I'm just going to make it go right now. And I just did it. And, and then I called back an hour later not to, to see if it worked, but to see what they're going to do. They said two seconds after you called. I mean, two seconds after we hung up, it left. It was over. I said, praise God. And that wasn't a surprise to me. I said, praise God. That's wonderful. That's good. I appreciate that. So, uh, but listen, as a born-again spirit, born-again believer, my spirit has been duplicated off of his. The Holy Spirit has not ever, not properly duplicated the Spirit of Christ. In other words, he never created one instantaneously that was 98% as tough as the original one. Every one that he's ever done is an exact replica of the first one. So if the first one could withstand all kind of attacks of mental anguish, sexual things that would come against him, uh, the God of this world saying, I'll make you a God, the God complex, all those things. If his spirit was tough enough, our spirit is tough enough. Glory be to God. See, we've been, we've been on this plane, and this is where he's wanting to take us as kings and priests. We've been on this plane of like, I'm just trying to survive this depression. And he's saying, no, no, no. <laughs> Sweetheart or son, listen, I don't want you to survive the, the depression. I want you to go into the asylums. I want you to go in there where they're slobbering all, all over each other and where they're just crazy and you, people are screaming. and, and that, that stuff can't get on you. You're a king and priest. I want you to go in there and get them healed. Well, I, I can't resist this sin. <laughs> well, I heard a preacher in the back say you just don't want to. <laughs> Pastor Dave used to say, he used to say, you're a panty waste. <laughs> no, if we got the same toughness that Jesus got, you're a sissy. <laughs> well, I'll just beat you up and show you that I ain't a sissy. Even after you whip me, I got something to tell you. You are a sissy. <laughs> if you can't say no to sin, you are deliberately not living like the person you are on the inside. You've got a tough, you're tougher than this. And with that, let's all stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. (laughs) Father, we just praise you and we thank you for your great grace. As we go forth as kings and priests in the earth, you've called us to do something that one generation before us, several generations have done, but Lord, this generation now is the one that probably brings you home. We ask you to help us to stand up tall and straight, strong, to collect our senses and say that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us and gave himself for us, the faithful witness. I commit them unto you, myself unto you, and our life going forward through Jesus Christ. Let these words sink deep into our hearts, and we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you.